Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Kritchmar from the University of California, Irvine. And I'd like to talk to you about uh, using robots, or what I like to call neural robots, as a means towards uh, explaining AI uh, through what's known as ethology or neuroethology. So this is based on a, a paper that uh, just came out in the last couple weeks from our group uh, called Neurorobotics or Neurorobots as a means towards neuroethology and explainable AI. And it was a collaborative group effort uh, by our, our team of uh, my former and current uh, students in the lab looking at some of the work that we had done and some of the work that's been done by others over the years in the field of neurorobotics. So understanding why deep neural networks and machine learning algorithms act as they do is, is difficult, uh, as, as we all know. But uh, biologists are faced with similar problems. So uh, how does the brain of these organisms actually lead to uh, interesting behavior? And so the field of neuroethology uh, addresses these, this issue. Uh, you closely observe behavior uh, while recording from neurons and brains or manipulating brain circuits. And uh, this is not a new thing. Uh, decades ago, uh, Nico Tinberger, Turn Tinbergen raised uh, questions about how to explain behavior. So what is the causal base of behavior? Ontogeny, you know, how does behavior develop over uh, a lifetime? Uh, during that lifetime, adaptation, how does, the, uh, how does the animal adapt to its environment? And then phylogeny, how does the behavior evolve over many generations? And if you think about these questions and how to maybe answer them, one constant theme is behavior, comes up over and over again. So understanding and observing the behavior, you can learn a lot. So these same questions could be applied to AI. And if we use the field of neurorobotics, uh, it has a long history of explaining how neural activity leads to interesting lifelike behavior. You have robots with some sort of body structure, active sensing, uh, and they are under neural control with an artificial neural network. So we can observe this robot's behavior, but we have the added uh, capability of recording from every single neuron and synapse in this artificial brain. So it makes a, for a powerful tool for understanding neuroscience questions, and I'd like to argue that it might be a way of actually uh, explaining AI systems and machine learning. So um, I'm going to go through a bunch of examples. Uh, there's many more in the paper uh, in different categories, such as perception, memory and navigation, neuromodulation, uh, attention, uh, neuromorphic engineering, which uh, actually is uh, useful for actually applications. Uh, locomotion, how to make these things move naturally, and then uh, a social interaction, how uh, robots could interact with uh, each other or interact with, with people. So let's start with perception. It's closely coupled with action. You can't separate them. So embodied models can lead to a better understanding of how perception leads to behavior. And there's many neural robotic studies that can uh, explain these sensory motor behavior responses. Uh, in vision, olfaction, auditory. But let's look at tactile. So this is work by Tony Prescott's group uh, with their whisker bot. And it was based on the rat whisking. And so it does active whisking and it uses a macro vibrissa to locate objects and then uses its micro vibrissa right now to actually explore the objects more. And uh, this was based on the rat, but it's actually uh, dog size as you can see. And so uh, it was actually a materials problem in many ways to find out what's the right material that could scale up and have the same characteristics uh, as a rat's uh, hair, hair whiskers. Uh, and I think they use broom bristles. And to understand how this behavior might drive things like attention or selecting action, they made a model of the superior colliculus in basal ganglia. And the, the robot would use its whiskers to decide if it's going to explore, uh, go back, you know, find its way back, or actually orient to a stimulus. And it did this all with tactile perception. Now, memory and navigation has uh, been a very fruitful area for neurorobotics and very important for just robotics in general. 
But uh, robotic experiments that are kind of neurally based can link the perception, memory, what we call cognitive mapping, and spatial navigation uh, to different brain areas. And also uh, these areas, which include the hippocampus and medial temporal lobe, uh, in their interactions in the neocortex can explain how experience consolidates into long-term representations of space. And uh, we can make memory models to explain these actions because the robots explain their action by maybe manipulating an object interestingly or, or just visiting a location. So it expresses its memory by, by visiting a location. So in biology and neurobiology, one of the gold standards for spatial memory that's hippocampal dependent is the Morris water maze. And you see this rat being put in a tank of water. Rats are good swimmers, uh, but he's highly motivated to get out of this situation. This tank of water is kind of opaque, uh, but eventually after lots of practice, it's able to find this, uh, this location or platform. And we wanted to do this in a robot, but we didn't want to use uh, a submarine robot. So we made a dry variant of this. Uh, and we made a detailed model of the hippocampus and its surrounding areas. And it got information from visual cues, tactile cues, uh, and also an internal compass that gave it like head direction cells. And over time, after about the same amount of time it would take a rat, it learned to make uh, routes towards this platform. And it never went the same way twice to this platform. Uh, now, this is all done in a lab, but it's important to see if some ideas like this, this is a hippocampal model with entorhinal cortex and cortical areas, uh, but can something like this actually transfer to real, real world settings? Uh, and this is work not by our group, but by a group in Australia, uh, Michael Milford and, and Janet Wiles and Gordon Wyeth, uh, that made a neural robot uh, based on the idea of place cells and grid cells uh, in the hippocampus and in the rhinal cortex. And instead of putting their robot, uh, instead of putting their model on a robot, they put their model on a laptop and put the laptop on top of a, I think this is Michael Milford's car. And it used mainly visual input, but it built up based on the place cells and uh, what they call pole, pole, pose cells that were very much like place cells and, and other cells that looked a lot like grid cells. And the, uh, the car drove around uh, Brisbane in, in Queensland, Australia. And over time, it started to build a map. And this is the resulting map from uh, their model, which they call Ratslam, which if you look closely at the roads, looks almost identical to the city map of Brisbane. So this shows that ideas from neuroscience uh, on how uh, animals actually build up spatial memory and, and place information can actually transfer to, uh, to real world applications. And, and this work uh, is, is as good as any state of the art SLAM system. Now, these areas that I've talked about are also very important for memory consolidation. So this is work by uh, Tse et al in uh, Richard Morris's lab. And they did some interesting experiments to show memory consolidation doesn't have to take a long time if it fits within a context or schema. So for these rats, the schema was this constellation of uh, little uh, places to dig for odors that actually had food. So you would cue the, the animal with an odor and then it would try and remember which one of these that had that, uh, that, had that odor which one of these places had that odor, and then it would get a, a yummy treat. And so it would take a long time to do this at first, but if you put the animal uh, in the same context or schema, uh, it could very rapidly uh, consolidate this memory. And the memory would be consolidated in neocortex. So it, it actually uh, it, it challenged the standard model that it takes a long time to transfer episodic memory from hippocampus to neocortex. It can happen very rapidly if it fits within context. Well, uh, my student Tiffany Hu was very interested in this and wanted to look at these brain areas and see if we could apply it to something, you know, uh, a more real world problem with a robot. So she had uh, hippocampal areas. She had an area for the medial prefrontal cortex, which drove the construction of these different schemas and neuromodulatory areas that uh, 
that signal if something was familiar or novel. And if something was, um, something was novel but familiar, it actually could be rapidly consolidated. So I'll show you the video on the lower right. The idea was you queue the system with an object to look for, like a teddy bear. This is the first time the robot with the uh, schema model is looking for a teddy bear. <clears throat> but as it's looking around, it's building up place information and also building up a schema of the objects that go in this classroom. Eventually it locates the teddy bear, but it's also acquired a whole bunch of knowledge in the meantime. So this is about four trials later. It's queued to go to the teddy bear. It remembers where it is. So it's ex explaining uh, how it does this by actually facilitating with memory, uh, with memory behavior. So now we put it in a different room, a break room that has uh, you know, food items and it's supposed to retrieve a cup. So again, it's building up place information about this whole room and it finds the cup eventually. And then we queue it a few trials later and it knows exactly where the cup should be. Now what's important, just like the rat, you can go back to the original schema, the classroom, and it's able to find objects. So it hasn't lost the memory of this previous thing it learned. Or you can queue with a new object like a banana and based on its experience, you see this heat map of place cells in its model that says, well, I, I predict that I would find a banana on the table in the break room. And there it finds the banana nicely. So this showed how schemas and the interaction between the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex may overcome things like catastrophic forgetting uh, and, and, also, um, and also continual learning in, in many ways. Uh, and, and also, I should also say few shot learning because if something fit within a schema, it learned it extremely rapidly, just like the rat did. Okay, I mentioned a little bit about neuromodulation, but I do wanna go into more detail about it. Uh, the neuromodulatory systems in vertebrates are really crucial for uh, responding to environmental events and, and causing uh, adjustment to changes. Uh, and because these adjustments uh, hap happen, uh, due to neuromodulation, they actually are often realized in behavior. So you can actually observe them actually adjusting uh, and you can tie that to the response of the neuromodulatory systems. So for example, this, uh, this robotic experiment I did a few years ago was in a similar environment that you do with a, a mouse called the open field test. And uh, typically a mouse, when it's in a, in a room that it's unfamiliar with, will we'll hover around the edges, uh, hide in its nest or uh, somewhere dark. And then when it feels like it's safe, it'll actually make crossings uh, into the middle of the room. Oops, let me get this guy started. So we made a model of this idea using a, a model of serotonin and dopamine where the anxious behavior was regulated by serotonin levels. So if serotonin was high, like it is now, when it's unfamiliar with this room, the robot would stay near the walls and then it's now moving towards a charging station that's its home nest, that's a safe place. But over time, if nothing bad's happened, the dopamine levels start to increase and that drives the behavior, causing it to explore the middle of the room and maybe a novel object like this thing is bouncing into now. And, and so this way we could actually see how uh, the trade-off between anxious behavior and curious behavior might be regulated by different neuromodulators. And this actually has implications that we could do artificial lesions or, or artificial drugs, if you will, to look at this as a model of anxiety disorder or uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. We can also look at neuromodulation and its application to attention. So. Uh, areas like the noradrenergic system and the cholinergic system uh, can actually drive attention and, and the allocation of attention. And it can cause, the, especially the noradrenergic system can cause a rapid switches of tasks uh, and a shift in intent, attention. And, um, and the cholinergic system then can allocate attention to what's important. <clears throat> so this is work by my student, uh, Xin Wen Zhou who 
took this idea and then this model of this idea of a cholinergic attention and apply it to a robot task where the, the person interacting with a robot says, I, I, I want something, uh, I want something to, to eat. And so then the robot's attention starts looking at objects that might be uh, edible, like this apple. And uh, as it's doing that, the model of the neuromodulatory system, we can record from that and see how that's leading to uh, changes in behavior. And let me just take a look here. So this is uh, screenshots from that video where it's looking first for something that goes with the, uh, the, the uh, goal of eating. And it decides that the apple has the highest rate, uh, highest uh, attention. And so then it'll go and pick up an apple. And we, we challenge this system with different tasks. So the, the robot uh, might have, be, have to say hi, or uh, so a wave to a person, or it might be that the task is to read. And so then it would look for books. Uh, you saw eat, so it looked for the apple, or work, it would look for uh, some of the, like a computer or, or even the book again. And each, every so often, the task will switch, and the robot has to figure out what should be the new task. Every time uh, a new switch happens, it doesn't meet the robot's expectations. There's a surprise, and there's a phasic response of the noradrenergic activity in the system. After that phasic response happens, the cholinergic activity that's applying attention, in this case to work, actually now uh, it throws away its priors and starts to build up uh, predictions of what, the, what the, uh, the need is now, which this time becomes eat. All right, so in this way, we can, all, we can tie the attention behavior, uh, attention activity to the neural, uh, neural activity. So locomotion is also very important to robots. And if you look at biological organisms, they are amazing at getting over land, air, water. Uh, and so neurobotics uh, could be a good way of actually looking at these interactions because of course it's tying the, the brain, the body and the environment together. And uh, in the case of the robotics, you know, we can access the control system, which is its artificial brain to uh, to look at these different actions and how the locomotion is, is happening. And um, I'll talk about a couple of these, but let's talk, uh, let's concentrate on this first, this uh, salamander robot that was designed by Aki Eichsberg. And um, he designed a robot that could both, it's amphibious like a salamander, so it can swim and it can walk. And it is controlled by a set of central pattern generators in its artificial spinal cord. And let's go to a movie of this so you can see what I mean. So here's the salamander robot swimming in the water with a nice traveling wave. And as the water gets shallower, its feet start to drag a little bit on the ground. And this central pattern generator automatically switches from swimming to now quadruped locomotion. And it gives an idea also about the phylogeny uh, of how, how actually they might evolve to go from water to land. And another uh, robot I wanted to talk about uh, is a hexapod robot that uh, can adapt different gates. And it does something akin to mental simulation. So if you look at this video, here's the robot initially walking on all six legs nicely, but what if one of those legs gets injured? So now it's not doing so well, but its artificial neural system can try out likely different gates in its mind and then actually play them out in, uh, in the environment like this. So it tried out this one gate, didn't work as well, tried out another, and it's just rapidly going through different possibilities that putting together some of the things that it's experienced before, but some that it's never experienced before. And now you see it's getting much better. And in very short time, it's able to now move forward with only five out of its six legs. And this is the 
the one that the robot cho chooses and it's doing quite well. And if you look at it in slow motion, it's got really, it's not just dragging, it's doing interesting new dynamics to actually make this movement. And while this isn't necessarily brain-based, it's very brain-like in the way it's actually doing this mental simulation uh, when, you're, when it's injured and some trial and error on its own without anyone interfering. Okay, so I've talked about uh, a bunch of robot examples uh, that were more kind of uh, looking at neuroscience questions, uh, but also there's, there's an application for a lot of these things. And there's a new field uh, in computer science and hardware called neuromorphic engineering. And they're specifically designing these hardware engineers circuits that are inspired by neurons. Uh, the brain is incredibly, uh, uh, incredibly efficient and uses very little power. Uh, compared to real computers. And so, um, like the brain, these neuromorphic chips are, consist of small connected units like neurons, and they all run in parallel, but they run asynchronously without a clock. So they're event-driven, just like real neurons. What comes out of that is hardware that can compute with magnitudes less energy than a conventional computer. And for roboticists, this could be a wonderful application if you have a robot that needs to run for long periods of time that's not near a power source. So um, my student Tiffany Hu with a bunch of IBM engineers uh, used the IBM True North to actually de develop a self-driving vehicle. This was work in Telluride, Colorado. And um, it's, you can't really tell, but it's going up a, a tough a mountain trail and there's a hundred foot drop off to the left. So we, we got to put a rope because on top of that robot is uh, IBM's True North chip. And this is the first time it was used on an embedded system. So the IBM engineers are, are really, really excited because this is what they designed it for, but it hadn't been used. Uh, and so it, it showed that with just a small nickel metal hydride hobby battery that's powering the robot and its sensors, uh, it's also powering this neuromorphic chip. And we ran it for continuously for like 20, 30 minutes up and down these trails. So it really, uh, this is a very early work, but it really showed the, the potential of these neuromorphic chips. Uh, another group, um, which is uh, uh, the group, the Nengo people, uh, Terry Stewart and Chris Elias Smith, uh, teamed up with uh, Jurg Conrad, who does a lot of neuromorphic chips and then Steve uh, Ferber, who makes the uh, Spinnaker neuromorphic chip. And uh, they had a robot that had a Spinnaker, um, a bunch of Spinnaker chips on it that controlled the robot and also took information from these sensors. So not only do the, um, the computing parts have to, uh, can be neuromorphic, but the sensors can be. So these aren't cameras, these are uh, um, event-driven uh, sensors. So, Anytime there's any change in, um, in contrast, like uh, on a pixel, uh, a pixel like go increase in contrast or decrease, then you get a spike, just like a retina. So uh, any movement uh, across this imager will, will give a spike. And because it's just a spike, it's event driven, the only things that are sent to this computer are uh, pixels that have changed at a given time. So they put two of these on and put it on a robot uh, that had to go down a corridor. And it did something similar to a bead does. So it balanced the optic flow across these two uh, uh, vision sensors uh, to make sure it stayed in the center of a, of a corridor. And so this is a nice demonstration of uh, a bee navigation system. So an insect navigation system that was played out on a real neuromorphic sensor taking very, very little energy. Okay, the last area I wanted to go through uh, is the social interaction. So uh, robots uh, and AI and robotics uh, are making systems hopefully to aid humans in their daily tasks. And uh, neurorobotics can help uh, do that and also uh, explain how these models of, neuro, uh, of social interaction work. Uh, and you can compare the human behavior uh, and, and interact with, with humans. And so this is one robot that uh, made by uh, Christian Balkanis and Johansson uh, in Lund University in Sweden uh, called the epi-humanoid robot. And uh, it's just a beautiful example of how uh, some 
uh, pupil control or the eyes can really generate some effective uh, robotics, socially effective robotics, and, and also a, a feeling of emotion. And one of the things that drives uh, the pupil size is the norgenergic system in the brain. So this robot, if you open up its head, has intricate gears to control the uh, dilation and contraction of pupils. And it has a detailed model uh, of the norgenergic system and a, a whole bunch of other brain areas that are controlling uh, the size of the pupil. And uh, if you see this robot in action, you, you really feel like uh, this robot is, is feeling uh, real emotion and demonstrating real emotion just because of the changes in the eye. And very briefly, uh, there's a long history of neurorobotics in language and imitation learning. Uh, and that's because the understanding of language and the acquisition of language really is driven by the semantic meaning of the word and it involves learning associations between these words and actions and objects in the world. Uh, and so there's been a lot of work over the years to, to uh, look at how uh, interaction of a robot in the world could lead to, uh, to language acquisition and also imitation learning. So this is work by Luke Steeles, actually where the robot learns its own vocabulary of objects. Uh, and this is early work by June Tani's group who's done a lot of work in imitation learning and showing how uh, recurrent neural networks can acquire uh, not only language but also imitating gestures. And then this is a couple images from the iCub project in Europe. Uh, this is an early version of the iCub and this is a simulation of the iCub which has learned to acquire, uh, acquire language by interacting with people and also manipulating objects. So that was a, a very quick tour through just a few of the examples uh, in the paper. Uh, and then there's even more examples that, that we couldn't even cover in the paper. But the, 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 the theme is that the behavior of these robots helps explain neural activity and how this neural activity can lead to interesting behavior. And because it's uh, uh, on a robot in a real environment, there's this closed loop. So you're coupling the inputs and outputs of the environment with the artificial brain, but you have complete access to the artificial brain to tie this to behavior in ways that would be really difficult with animal model, animal models. So the explainability comes with these embodied interactions. And just to give you a kind of an idea, in the, in the paper there's a table, which is probably too small to, to see, but all of these different areas, we listed uh, different studies and whether they made a neural, neuroscience prediction or they were neuroinspired that actually drove some, uh, some action, uh, uh, drove some application. And, and sometimes they did both. So there, there's uh, both, you can make neuroscience prediction, you can also make applications and you can actually use the behavior plus looking at the brain system, tying those two things together to explain how these things work. So to wrap up, uh, as artificial intelligence systems and deep neural networks and, and artificial neural networks get more and more complicated, it may be good to take a step back and instead of overanalyzing the network dynamics, you know, observe the behavior of the system. Uh, and so when we are often posed with a question, you know, what is intelligence? Well, the answer is often, I don't know, but I'll know intelligence when I see it. And these neurorobotics uh, offer uh, an opportunity to uh, see the intelligent behavior and then maybe we can explain what, what makes us smart and intelligent. So I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention.